So if you looked at some of the optional derivation, what you would have seen is that we figured out the um, objective function. When we define our objective function as the sum squared error between our prediction yi, uh, sorry, our prediction y hat, and what we actually want, y, we can actually just take the difference between those, square them, sum them all up, and it turns out <clears throat> what we really wanted to do is we take the derivative of this objective function with respect to w sub j. And there are many, many optimization algorithms that when we take the derivative, um, it actually tells it, it gives it a better idea of how to change the values of w the next time that it tries a new value of w to try and minimize this function. By giving it the derivative, we can actually tell it which direction to move w in such that we get a better estimate of w, which basically minimizes that objective function even more. And so let's just be concentrated on what we need to do numerically to make this an efficient um, code. Right? So what we'll eventually want to do is represent this with NumPy operations. <clears throat> now, one thing to notice is that you know, uh, what we have here are we have these um, values of y, values of x, and we also have these w values. And so the size of w that we have right here, the size of w is actually, you know, they're, they're, for each element of w, we need to take a derivative between it. So this is d by dw sub j um, for each of the elements that we have inside of w. All right, so the length of w is actually determined by the number of columns that were in our original x matrix, right? So, um, because that's what we use to multiply, you know, each of the w's by, we multiply w times each of the rows of x to get our estimate of y, put it through the sigmoid. So, essentially what that means is that we're going to need to um, perform this operation for each value of j right here. So we have two for loops, one that um, iterates an outer for loop that iterates over j, and an inner, inner for loop which iterates over i when we actually take that summation. So uh, we can actually just code that up into Python, no problem. Um, right there, there's a nested for loop and we can code that. But, and actually the what that actually looks like if we code that up is, is this. Let's say if we want to calculate the gradient of the objective function, we'll call this um, our implementation. We'll do a couple of different implementations of the gradient, A, B, and C. If we do the A implementation, well, we just need to know what y hat is. So I'm gonna create this vector yh, which is equal to you know y hat of x and w together. So yh is like this, this y hat vector that we have right here. Um, and then <clears throat> for, um, for j in the length of w, uh, I'm going to create you know temp equals zero, and then I'm going to say temp equals temp plus, and I'm just going to draw out this equation that we had right here, which was equal to um, you know y minus y hat, one minus y hat multiplied by y hat right, that we have right here, and then also multiplied by the ith instance of x and the jth element, right? The jth element. So what that means is that you know if i were to equal one and j were to equal one, I would be accessing the very very first element inside of x right there, right? If um, <clears throat> i were to equal two and j were to equal one, I'd be accessing the first element of the x uh, x two, okay? Um, and then I multiply the whole thing by negative two because that's you know here on the summation, and I um, append that to something called the gradient, right? Which is essentially just the derivative. Um, it's the derivative that has the same size as w. So for our example, w has two elements, w1 and w2. The gradient would also have two elements um, that tells it which direction it needs to move each of the w1 and w2 um, to get a better estimate to minimize that objective function. But one thing to notice here is that um, I'm actually repeating a lot of calculations by going through and doing this in a for loop. Um, one of the things that I could do is actually, well, this operation, it happens for each i, but I don't need to recalculate it every time that I recalculate j, 
Um, I could actually say, well, this is just a temp, temp vector. And I could go through and I could put this temp vector together for each value of y, such that temp just becomes one single vector, which is equal to, you know, y minus y hat times 1 minus y hat times y hat. So it's essentially getting rid of this step. I don't have to do this every single time in a new element of j. Right? And so, well, I can actually do that. So what I can say here is that our temp is equal to y hat the vector element-wise multiplication between y minus y hat and 1 minus y hat. Right? So that's exactly this equation right here. Right? So y minus y hat do an element-wise multiplication with 1 minus y hat element-wise multiplication with y hat. So that's my temp vector that I've just defined. And what this um, equation is telling me that for each of those temp vectors, I need to multiply it by x of i and j, and then take the sum. Um, and this is kind of an interesting thing. I can get rid of this um, explicit sum that I have right here by noticing that this x of j right here, if I can represent that as a vector, Really all that it is, is I'm grabbing all of the first elements of each of the ith rows. So, so all of like x1 through xn, I'm just grabbing the first element if j equals 1. If j equals 2, I'm grabbing the second element of x. So for our example, we only have two elements in x, but you can imagine that this has any dimension of features, right? So I could grab the very end. Um, and I would be able to get, you know, w sub uh, w1, uh, w2, w3, however many there might be. All right. So if I define those vectors to be, um, we'll call them x j, right? X j is a vector over all i, right? So it goes from i equals one, all the way to i equals n. So if I slice that operation, um, right? If I were to slice this, this would be x of all of the rows in the jth column. And now I want to take that and I want to do a multiplication. I actually want to do a dot product with my temp variable. And that's just taking, well, it does a multiplication, a point by point multiplication of x and temp. And then, because it's a dot product, it sums all of them up, right? So I'm able to get one single value for each of the gradients. And that implementation is done right here, right? And so this is slightly more what's called vectorized coding because I'm converting everything into vectors and then doing the multiplication, right? And I don't have to explicitly call this sum because that's part of uh, matrix multiplication, the dot product. So I define temp, and then for each j, I multiply temp times x at the j, and then I multiply by negative two and take the sum that I have right here. So I do an element-wise multiplication and add them up, which is the exact same thing as just doing the dot product between the two. But, you know, it turns out that I'm actually repeating even more calculations right here because there's no reason that I have to say x at the j multiplied by temp. What I can actually do here is just use my original definition of x um, to calculate things that, so this is the temp vector that I had previously, I can just do the dot product with x, and that's automatically going to be going, you know, um, column by column inside of my x matrix and multiplying them, right? So I don't have to explicitly say that this is the jth column that I want. That's just simple matrix multiplication. I can just say, you know, y hat minus y, 1 minus y hat, and take the dot product between that and my original, my large matrix x, multiply by negative 2, and now I've taken this entire objective function for all values of j and boiled it down to one calculation. Now that's important because what that means is that under the hood, C++ is doing all of the for loops, all of these, and they're optimized, very, very efficient using NumPy operations to perform the gradient estimation, which means the calculation of the derivative now becomes extremely fast for us to do. So let's actually use the minimization function that's built into SciPy, but now we're gonna tell it what the gradient function is so that it can better estimate the values of W and it can iterate more quickly 
through these. And so that's what we'll do. I'm going to use something called percent time right here, which is part of a magics in, in the Jupyter notebook that just allows me to take, well, how much time did it take to run this line of code? It only runs the line of code once, so you can get kind of some, some outlier values because you're not repeating calculations and seeing, you know, on average, how long does it take? You're just seeing how long did it take to run this just one line of code. Um, but what we're going to do is I'm going to call the minimization function and we'll use it without using the gradient and then we will um, do the exact same function that we had before but now I'm going to tell it that the derivative is equal to the objective function <coughs> gradient using objective gradient a to calculate the gradient function and so that was this definition up here then I'm going to tell it to use the gradient, which they all have the same values, but use the gradient with a different implementation B and a different implementation C. And then I'm going to print out, well, what were the values that it found? What are the X values? And how many function evaluations did it take to calculate W to minimize this objective function? So I'm going to run this. It'll actually run uh, fairly quickly right here. Oh. Looks like I've, oh, maybe I didn't run this line of code. So I didn't, I didn't run this block, which means I didn't define any of the functions that I'm trying to run. So now I'll run it again. It runs fairly quickly. Um, and I can immediately see that all of the functions, all of these found very, very similar values of W. However, when I didn't use the gradient, it took 95 different function evaluations. I had to evaluate the objective function 95 times. Whereas the other three, when I evaluated the gradient, I only had to evaluate the objective function 14 times. I had to calculate the gradient multiple times for each new value of w, but I only had to do the objective function 14 times. And if we look and see, let me run this one more time. Let's see if we can. Um, and let's do it one more time. What we can see here is that um, I get decreasing values. If I run these, let's see. Um, well, actually, what we need to do is we need to run these multiple times. So it's taking just a little more time depending on what's happening. I've got some filming going on on my laptop, and so it's not everything is not getting the, the exact same number of threads. So essentially, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to run this, and the time it function will run each line multiple times, and it'll give me the average value, the average number of um, so this one it ran 10 loops um, and it said that you know it took about 37 milliseconds uh, for each loop about 65 milliseconds for each loop but then um, for the last kind of two well let me run this one more time so it actually comes in here so when I'm actually calculating the gradient using numpy operations it's much faster per loop iteration. Um, and when I'm not doing filming on my laptop, it's even, uh, it's even more pronounced what the differences here are. Um, but essentially, the gradient value when I use um, vector, vectorized optimization, it's 10.4 milliseconds when I use gradient B. And then on average, it's even smaller than that when I use the gradient C estimation. So each time when I'm using C++ to do more and more of the heavy lifting, um, it's actually getting me better and better estimates. And we can actually see here that when I'm calculating the gradient really poorly, when I'm just using for loops in Python, it actually it takes longer than if I didn't even know what the gradient was. Okay, so let's do some fun things. So now we have this kind of sigmoid solution where I'm using you know objective gradient C right here. Um, let's actually make this interactive and you can you can look at this code in your own time, but essentially what we're going to do here is we're going to create some, um, we're going to create x random. Uh, we're going to do it on the fly. We're going to calculate it each time. And I'm going to tell it, I'm going to use the input function to tell it, oh, okay, what should the um, slope for the sigmoid be? And also, how much should noise should be added to y? And so this is kind of a, a way of rapidly going through. So if I run this code, it's going to ask me, okay, well, what's the sigmoid shape that I want to have? So I'm going to give it a slope of, say, 3. And enter a value for the noise fraction, let's say 0 0.1. So if I do that, it's going to go up here and it's going to try and find a solution. So in the solution, what it prints out are 
the points, the random points that I have, and then it puts out the best fit sigmoid through that point, through those lines that we found. All right, I can calculate this again and give it maybe, you know, six is the slope, even more. Maybe give it slightly more noise, 0 0.3. Let's see what it does. Yeah, it's a lot noisier. The slope that it found was actually equal to 6.8 versus 6. Um, but you can see this is, this is a pretty good curve fit through some random data that's getting generated here that's, that's, that's getting taken across. Um, and you know, finally, I, I, you know, I do want to leave you with a couple of examples here. There's, uh, when you're using an IPython notebook, one of the real advantages of it is you can actually add user interface elements into the notebook itself. So I'll let you look at this in your leisure if you want to and kind of figure out what it is that I'm doing. But essentially, I create a function to create um, you know, I give it the noise power that I want, um, but essentially I create a function to go through and do exactly the same thing that we did before where um, I, uh, I minimize the objective function and um, then I call this widgets.interact. Um, and essentially what that allows me to do is I can set the value of W, see if that's the value of W, and I can set the noise power here, maybe 0.28 with a W of negative three. And now I actually, you know, figure out what the curve function is that I want it to do. So I've added these user interface elements. I could reduce the noise and then plot it again. Right here, I could reduce the noise even more, make it a really, really fine sigmoid, and now I have a curve fit through here. And I can make the slope, I can ever increase the slope, the value, the actual value of W that I'm putting through, right? I can make it extremely sloped if I want to, right? And so now we have a really nice curve fitting algorithm um, that when it was 9.8, it figured out that, oh, 9.7 is a really good estimate of that. If I increase the noise, it might get a little noisier, um, but 10.3 versus 9.8. So it's doing a pretty good job of finding a best fit sigmoid. The last thing that I want to leave you with is that there's um, some, at this point in time, they're new, um, but there's some ways of using C++ code under the hood <clears throat> by compiling Python code, especially when you're using NumPy operations. So what I want to do here is I'm going to import something called Numba. So Numba is essentially, you know, we, we I talked to you that Travis Oliphant was the creator of NumPy. He also created something called Numba that is a just-in-time compiler for Python. So uh, essentially what it allows you to do at a very high level is if I add this decorator at JIT, and I um, wrap a function which performs for loops over Python lists. And also, you know, it can use NumPy arrays and NumPy operations. It will try to compile this code. So it'll try to look at the uh, Python implementation and then come up with a compiled C++ implementation of the function and use that C++ compiled function every time I call objective grade A. And so when I wrap that, the first time I try to call the code, um, it will actually try to, it'll compile it. So I have a, a the initially when I run that function, um, I hit a hit of the time that it takes to compile that function. But every time I run it after that, it'll already be compiled um, and it'll run much, much faster. So even though I'm using for loops in Python, I can make them really quick. So um, what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll define this at JIT. Um, and then I'll call the objective function gradient so that it tries to compile it the first time. And now I'm going to redo my comparison between the objective functions where, you know, grad C was what we had before. Um, and then grad B was the second fastest. Grad A was actually doing worse than Nelder Mead. So let me run this. And again, I'm filming on my laptop, so we'll, we'll, we'll see how this um, I was able to do. Um, but essentially... So it looks like it's taking 5.9 milliseconds um, to do Nelder Mead, 3.7 milliseconds to do the compiled gradient A function, objective gradient A. Um, and through, so let's run this one more time to make sure that it's not trying to compile things on the fly. Yeah, so essentially what I can see here is that the differences, and again, if I run this without a lot of other things running on my machine, then essentially the differences now, you know, this is no longer 45 milliseconds or 100 milliseconds. It's actually really, really close on par with the, um, 
the implementation of the, oh, sorry, this is this. This is the just-in-time debug. It's 2.56, which is just slightly slower than the objective function. So even though it is faster to use pure NumPy operations for this particular function, um, I, by just compiling the for loops that I had and leaving the code very understandable and readable, um, I can use Numba to go in and compile that code and get it to something that's almost as fast as using these native vectorized NumPy operations. And so that's always something to keep in mind in your back burner is that, you know, even if I don't want to define things as linear algebra, I might be able to compile that code and use it um, and not pay for, you know, too much of a hit, even though I'm using expressive uh, Python notation to perform a lot of the numerical optimization techniques that I have.